let me start now. Perfect. Let me start again. So again, good morning. My name is Mike Million, president of the Private Motor Truck Council of Canada. Uh, I want to thank you for taking time out of your day today to join us for this webinar. Thanks to our sponsors, Fleet Metrica and Kim Richardson Transportation Specialist. Uh, this webinar was made available for free. Um, obviously, the Canadian ELD mandate is a topic that many people are interested in. Uh, we have over 275 people registered for today's seminar. Um, we have roughly 135 online right now. We'll see if more tick up. Uh, just so you do know, everybody that is registered will receive a recorded copy of this presentation, uh, as well as a PDF of the PowerPoints that we're going to go through. So everybody will get a copy of that when we are complete. Um, I want to thank our speakers who are joining us today, and I'll introduce them a little bit later, but we have six highly, highly regarded experts from manufacturers of devices or resellers of devices in the Canadian uh, electronic logging uh, device or recording mandate. I'm going to start it off by doing about a 15 minute overview of where we sit with the rules and regulations. Once that is complete, we will bring our panelists on. We will go through um, some prepared questions that we have for our panelists. If you have any questions throughout the day, put it in the chat window. They will go to the host and co-host only, and we will address those questions at the end of today's presentation. Just before I get into my uh, brief presentation, um, I'd like to play a message from one of our sponsors. Uh, I'm gonna put myself on mute, turn my camera off, uh, and we'll listen to a message from uh, one of our sponsors today, Fleet Metrica, and I will be back in just a second. The trucking industry is facing challenging fleet issues that are weighing on your profitability and may be threatening your very survival as a company. The issues I'm referring to include the driver shortage, skyrocketing insurance rates, significant increases in costs for wages, fuel and maintenance, and more recently COVID-19 and the impact this is having on your operation. Fleet Metrica enables you to tackle these issues with winning solutions that help minimize the impact these issues are having on your business. The way we do that is through scorecard programs. By leveraging data from your onboard technologies, regardless of which suppliers you're using. For example, our flagship product safety monitor, which has been in the market for 10 years, enables you to easily implement a driver scorecard program that addresses many of these issues. The way it works is we provide insightful and actionable information back to your managers, which enables them to have a useful dialogue with their drivers and staff on improving their performance. And for drivers, it gives them near real-time feedback in the palm of their hands and how they're performing, as well as enabling them to take action. All of this results in more satisfied employees and inspires them to improve performance, which leads to improvement in overall safety and efficiency for the fleet. One of the main reasons fleets are using our solution is because it's a low cost, high return initiative that addresses the issues that are important to you. And it doesn't require additional staffing to manage this program. We automate that process and make sense of the data for you. Let us help you address the most pressing issue in your business today by contacting us at info at fleetmetrica.com. We look forward to helping you survive and thrive in this difficult time. Thank you. Thanks to Fleet Metrica for their sponsorship and for that presentation. Just give me a sec while we change the trucking industry is screen shares here. Um, and I will get my prepared notes up. All right, so where do we sit as of today on the Canadian ELD mandate? So the Federal ELD regulation actually came into effect on June 12th uh, of this year, so just three or four months ago. 
It applies to the same federally regulated carriers and their commercial drivers who are required to maintain a daily log under the hours of service regulations. So you may ask yourself if the ELD regulation came into effect uh, back in June, um, how is it that nobody has been fined for not operating uh, a compliant electronic logging device? Um, and the answer to that is, uh, a little bit complicated, but in the simplest of terms, the Canadian Council of Motor Transport uh, Administrators worked with the provinces, territories, and the federal government on a phased in enforcement plan uh, that was announced. All the jurisdictions agreed to issue no punitive penalties until at least June 12th of 2022. And of course that was required because to be compliant with this regulation, you have to have a certified electronic logging device, which was approved by a independent third party and is listed on Transport Canada's list of approved devices. And on June 12th of 2021, we didn't have any approved devices, so nobody would be able to comply with the mandate. Therefore, uh, provinces and territories who are in charge of actually enforcing the federal regulation, um, agreed to defer enforcement for at least a year uh, in order to allow more devices to be certified, well, some devices to be certified, uh, get put on the list to allow industry to have a reasonable amount of time to comply with this regulation. Now, while we say there's going to be no punitive penalties till at least June 12th of 2022, there has been a couple jurisdictions indicate that they're going to start issuing warnings. So Manitoba and Alberta have indicated they were going to begin issuing warnings uh, in December. Um, the PMTC uh, has been lobbying both to change their approach on this. Uh, Alberta has verbally indicated to the PMTC that they plan to soften uh, their approach. However, we are still waiting to see this uh, in writing. So at this point, uh, again, I'll, I'll take them at the word, I, I'm gonna assume they're not gonna start issuing warnings in December or January, but we're still waiting to see the verbiage of that put up. Uh, Manitoba at this point is, uh, it, to be blunt, is still being stubborn. They're still indicating, and it's posted in their regulations, that they will begin issuing warnings on December 12th of this year. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, while they say that these warnings will not show up in a carrier's profile, and they will not show up on a carrier's or a driver's abstract, and they will have no punitive damages or negative effect on their profile in any way, shape, or form. I personally am still not in favor of that. I do not believe that we should be issuing warnings um, for a regulation that at this point in time, a very minuscule amount of the trucking industry would have any reasonable chance of applying with, uh, or complying with, sorry. Uh, and many carriers and drivers um, take great pride in making sure they're following the rules and regulations that are laid out. Uh, and whether it has punitive damages or not, um, you're gonna drive a bit of a wedge. I think a lot of carriers and, and drivers are gonna be very upset if you start issuing written warnings for something that they have no reasonable ability to be fully compliant with by that period of time. Um, um, so again, we're still working and hoping that Manitoba changes uh, PMTC's position. We should not be issuing any warnings. It should be education at this point with no warnings written until at least June 12th of 2022, which is when full enforcement also comes in. Uh, so a bit of history, FP Innovations was named as the first third party certification body in late October of 2020. Uh, so the process is, um, if you want to become a body that is allowed to certify manufactured ELDs, you have to apply to the Standards Council of Canada. Um, they will run their tests on you. Um, once they are happy, they will announce that you passed the certification product process. Well, then that will then be forwarded to Transport Canada. They go through their approvals and it's put on the list. Once you're on the list as an independent certification body, manufacturers can now submit their devices to that certification body who will now test uh, electronic logging devices or at what that time will be an electronic recording device 
to see if it meets the Canadian federal ELD standard, which then would make it a certified ELD. CSA and Com Driver Tech were announced as the second and third certification bodies earlier this year. And these are the three certification bodies that are in place right now that manufacturers can submit their devices to. Changes to the technical standard and testing procedures have been made three times since of October of 2020. While these changes were made to address problems that were discovered through the process, it did still cause delays in certification of devices and likely is still for some manufacturers uh, at the current time. Uh, as I mentioned, once manufacturers are ready, they can apply to one of the three certification bodies to submit their devices for testing to begin the certification process. At the current time, as of today, we have six devices that are currently listed on the Transport Canada certified list of devices. Um, these links will take you to the Transport Canada website where these devices will be listed. Um, and it, Transport Canada has a page with other information and resources, and electronic logging devices, and it will also take you again to where these devices uh, are listed. Is six enough? Um, obviously not. A uh, couple things we have to keep in mind, and I'm not going to get too in depth into it because we're going to have an hour of time with our panelists. Things we have to keep in mind. A manufacturer is not certified, a device is certified. Okay, so if, um, you know, the suppliers we have on here today, Omnitrax, Isaac, um, Zonar Systems, um, Trimble, Geotab, um, et cetera, if any of these devices, fleet complete, if any of these devices are approved, it's a device that is approved. So um, if Omnitrax, has a device approved. That doesn't mean every device that Omnitrax has is approved. So you'll have to keep that in mind. If, if a supplier has multiple devices, each device has to be submitted for certification. Okay, so, so keep that in mind and you'll have to know the model number that you're operating to see if that's one of the ones that's on the certified list. Uh, and also keep in mind, you're gonna have to check the software version. But again, I'm not gonna get into that too much now. We'll get into that a little bit more later. As a carrier, you must ensure uh, by the time we reach, as of today, June 12th of 2022, you must ensure you have an approved ELD installed in your vehicles if they are federally regulated and your drivers and administrative staff are trained to use them, again, by the full enforcement date of June 12th of 2022. The entire Gazette 2 posting and technical standard can be viewed at these links. And again, you will receive copies um, of this PowerPoint uh, as well as a recording of the presentation. Those links will be on there for you so you can click through to. What exemptions do we have in place in Canada? There isn't many, uh, unlike the, the US who has quite a few uh, exemptions in place. In Canada, the exemptions are if you're operating under an hours of service permit or a motor vehicle transport authority exemption, if your truck is a pre-model year engineer 2000, and the CMV is being operated under a rental agreement of no more than 30 days. And that does not mean you can have a rental agreement for 29 days and then sign the same truck back out for another 29 days. It actually has to be a true short-term rental and you can't just keep extending the rental paperwork. That would not then qualify to be exempt from an ELD. Uh, and another thing to keep in mind, an electronic logging device on the federal regulation is required if you have to run a logbook. In Canada, if you travel within 160 kilometers of your home terminal, you are not required to keep a logbook. Uh, therefore, you would also be exempt from having to utilize an ELD. Doesn't mean you're exempt from the hours of service regulations. Uh, that's far from the truth. You still have to comply with those, but you could keep track of those in a different way. Um, many times they're called what we call a record of duty status. Um, but still, if you travel within the 160 kilometer radius of your home terminal and return there every day to take your required time off, uh, you will be exempt from having to run an ELD. 
Now, keep in mind one big difference between our regs and the Canadian and the U.S. regs. In the U.S., if you run outside of that 160 kilometer radius or 100 air mile radius, um, eight times or less in each 30 day period, then you are not required to have an ELD. Canada does not have that same rule. If you run inside the 160, 364 days of the year, but on day 365, you take a trip that's 200 kilometers away, you will need an ELD installed in your truck for that trip. Uh, so keep that in mind. That's a business decision you're going to make. If, if you have a truck that only was outside once or twice a year, um, do you want to put the ELD in it or are you going to hire somebody, somebody else to do that one or two particular runs? Again, that's a decision you have to make. But if that vehicle goes outside of that radius for that trip, it's going to require an ELD. Uh, as mentioned earlier, some of the issues we still are running into with our timeline as of today, we still only have six approved devices for carriers to select from. Um, and if your device was installed prior to being certified, it will likely need a software upgrade or replaced in order to be a compliant certified device. Um, if the device was installed a year ago and that model number was certified you know, yesterday, um, it's likely the software version that is in there is not client, therefore it wouldn't be a compliant device. You have to make sure that it has the latest software revisions and updates to make sure that's a compliant device and our manufacturers and suppliers will get into that a bit more as we, as we go along. What is the enforcement approach? I touched on this a bit at the start, but on May 5th, CCMTA issued a statement confirming the jurisdictions will begin with education and awareness on June 12th, and that full enforcement will not come into effect until at least June 12th of 2022. And that'll provide you a link to the statement. What should you do now? Um, begin researching your suppliers and devices if you haven't already. Uh, ask the tough questions, ask the supplier that you're looking into. Uh, will submit your device for certification. When will you submit? Which devices do you plan on submitting for certification? Um, in addition to that, review your routes, speak to your drivers. Some routes may be to be adjusted to be compliant. Um, many drivers in this industry just, just try to get the job done. Um, so they may be helping you with some creative writing, shall we say, in the logbook that is making that run compliant without you even know that they're doing that. Uh, so you need to talk to your drivers, you need to have honesty from them and you need to make sure that, uh, that there is certainty there because with a logbook, uh, with an electronic logging device, you can't shave a minute here or a minute there. If the truck's moving, you're driving. So you have to keep that in mind and make sure your drivers are aware. Uh, once you have picked a device, clearly communicate your plan to your drivers, support staff and IT. Schedule your installs, seek driver input as to the location the units will be installed. Um, they have to be mounted in a, in a position where they're within the driver's view. So for a legal requirement, some things are gonna be there, uh, but you wanna make sure uh, that they're also installed in a location where a driver has access and so they're not blocking their view of say a windshield, a mirror, et cetera. Train your operation staff and drivers before activating the ELD portion in the truck cab. Uh, you can install them, but not turn them on yet. You want to make sure people know how to use them, how to operate them from all ends of your fleet before you turn them on. Uh, I suggest training your drivers in segments, not all at once. Uh, ensure to include operations in your driver training so they know how the device works from the back office, as well as from the driver's point of view, because uh, they're likely going to have to troubleshoot with the drivers when they're having issues. So make sure they know how it looks from both ends. Uh, training will still be required. Talk to your supplier uh, to understand what the differences will be between the device you are using and the one that is certified to meet the standards. Uh, if you swap out devices or only required an over-the-air upgrade and do not train your drivers and operation staff, you are going to have major issues. A non-compliant device with the Canadian standard um, versus one that is compliant with the Canadian standard is going to operate totally different. So you're going to have to work with your supplier on that to understand what the differences are uh, and make sure training uh, 
is conducted with your with your drivers. Don't think just because you've been running an ERD for two years means that they're going to know how to operate an ELD. Um, and that's it from my presentation. Just before we get into bringing panelists on and asking them to supply input and opinions, um, I have a message from one more of our uh, sponsors today, uh, KRTS Transportation Specialists. So I'm going to stop my share, uh, put myself on mute, turn the video on. I ask that you, you listen to the message from one of our suppliers and I will return uh, in a minute. Good morning. My name is Matt Richardson. Good morning. My name is Matt Richardson, Vice President of KRTS. Thank you for participating in this morning's webinar. KRTS is a proud supporter of the PMTC, and we are happy to sponsor this morning's event. I'd like to now take this opportunity to talk to you about some of our current delivery options. Since 1989, KRTS has been the leader in education and training for the transportation and construction industries. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to adapt, adjust, and get creative to ensure we could continue to provide the highest quality training to our customers. While we continue to deliver in-person practical training with a number of different COVID precautions in place, we have also developed some strictly virtual and hybrid virtual and practical programs to make sure we have offerings for whichever type of education our customers are looking for. Some of our popular programs that are now being delivered in a hybrid model or fully virtual model include the NATME Certified Driver Trainer Program, the NATME Certified Director of Safety Program, the LLC Certified Defensive Driving Instructor and Certified Defensive Driver Programs, many different options for virtual driver safety meetings, as well as post-accident training, cargo securement, and transportation of dangerous goods. Many companies still prefer in-person training, which is being delivered on a regular basis for things such as pre-hire road tests, annual driver evaluations, forklift certifications, all types of heavy equipment training and certification, AZ or DZ license upgrading, and much more. It is our goal at KRTS through this pandemic and moving out of it that we have the ability to deliver our customers the quality education and training they have come to expect in a delivery method that fits their needs. Contact us to learn more at 905-765-3445 or check out our website at w. www.krway.com. We look forward to helping you with all your training and educational needs. Good morning. And thank you to KRS for that uh, for that message and for their sponsorship. Now we're going to get our panelists. So I'm do, instead of doing the bios, since we have a fulsome panel of six experts with us here today, uh, we're just going to quickly introduce them. Um, they're going to start turning their, their cameras on and, and unmuting. But with us today, uh, we have a great panel with lots of insight and knowledge that they'll be able to pass on. Uh, to our viewers, we have Mark Munsian, Vice President of Safety, Compliance and Regulatory Affairs, Fleet Complete and Big Road. Uh, Mike Ahart, Vice President of Regulatory Affairs, Omnitrax LLC. Fred Fakima, Vice President, Safety and Compliance, Zonar Systems. Frank Stowers, Senior Product Manager, Manager Trimble Transportation. Jean-Sebastian Bouchard, Executive Vice President of Sales and Co-Founder of Isaac Instruments, and John Thompson's Vice President, TKT, TKT Fleet Technologies. With that, gentlemen, I'm going to stop the share here so uh, we can get bigger pictures, everybody, to, to see your lovely faces on a, on a Tuesday morning. So, so gentlemen, thanks for, for taking the time today. Um, we do have some questions that we're going to go through a couple have come up in the chat window as well we've got about an hour uh, guys to uh the field here and i don't think that's going to be an issue so um I, i'm going to start with uh the first question here and we'll we'll get right to it uh so the first question and frank we're gonna we're gonna start with you on this one um 
so originally, as you know, the, the first question we had was, how are you progressing through the certification process? Um, as many people may know, it was actually just announced last week that Trimble has, uh, have, does have one device on the certified list now. So one of the six devices is a, is a Trimble one. Um, so I guess a couple questions for you. Were there any challenges in becoming certified? Um, and how many, so you have one device certified, how many devices does Trimble plan to, to submit and how is, is this progress? So Frank, I'll throw it over to you to start with. Sure, thanks Mike. Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, uh, Trimble's PMG platform is now certified. So we do expect a, a number of our other platforms which are currently registered in the US to undergo the same testing process in the coming quarters. Um, in the meantime, we're working closely with FP Innovations on the completion of testing for our PCG platform. Um, and you know, as we as we worked closely with them um, throughout the testing process for our PMG platform, which is which is now uh, registered. Um, and you know, we're happy with the things we've learned along the way. Um, I think that uh you know as we see this process continue we'll see both sides of the coin um take opportunity to evolve learn new efficiencies in the process and uh you know discover ways to make it faster um so so like i mentioned you know i think it's 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 there's what there's what's written down on paper and then there's the reality of really looking at at what an what a what all of these different eld platforms have to offer um, I think if, if, if there were any challenges, it was, it was probably that. But like I said, I think as we see time go on, we'll see these things evolve and, and new efficiencies be discovered. Okay. Uh, thanks, Frank. Um, Fred, I'll put it over to you. So um, same question, I guess, as you're going through, the, how are you progressing through the certification process? And, and what, if any, challenges are you, are you seeing in, in becoming certified? Well, it's a process. Um, I mean, <clears throat> our device is, uh, has been submitted and we're working with a uh, comm driver to, uh, to get through the, uh, the process at this time. Um, you know, just like everybody else, you, you kind of sit and wait and work through uh, the issues. And when something uh, comes up, you address that particular issue. As uh, some of the test cases change periodically, even uh, up until March, you know, so there's there's been adjustments that you have to do along the way and uh, retest and recertify your product. And so uh, we're, we're going through that process and hope to be done soon. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Fred. Um, John Sebastian, I'll, I'll come to you next. And, um, you know, I guess, you know, same question uh, coming from also the side that you also, Isaac also had, a device that was listed last week as, as being certified. So in addition to how you're progressing through the progress and the challenges, um, is there, you have one device certified, is there other devices that will be submitted for, for certification as well? Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, yes, Isaac had the, its uh, product certified last week. Uh, the first product, we will have a second product certified. Uh, the gateway component, we had the series two certified and came out last week. The series one is following very closely with FP Innovation. It's not really far behind. It's using the same software. It's using the same architecture. It's really an upgrade in chips and components. So they want us to have like both components really tested out and certified. Uh, so it's not really far behind. Uh, we're, we're happy to be here today and to be able to comment on this. I mean, it's been, it's, it's been challenging for Isaac, like it was for, for everyone, I think, on this panel. Uh, we try to like, bring the driver experience to another level in minimizing screen clicks. And when we, when we looked at the, at, the, at, the, at, at the regulation and we looked at the test case, we understood different, like, we understood that some things would be, would be acceptable. Uh, come in March when we released and applied to FP Innovation, we're quite confident that the version that we had back then would be certified right away in a minimal amount of time. It turns out that you know some of the automation that we had built, we need to work around and, and, and modify the way things were working. So that 
really increase the delay in getting the product certified. Today, we're happy with the version that we have. This is all behind us. Uh, the rest is really like, uh, not gonna say it's a walk in the park, but I mean, it's a process that we know that, uh, that we just need to finish up with them. Uh, so you should have and see within the next few weeks, a second device from Isaac being there. That will complete all the units that we have out there in the field. Uh, all the units that customers are using uh, will be covered with these two devices that you should see out there. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, John, move on to, to you now, same, same question. Uh, mm -hmm. what, are the, what are the challenges you're seeing through the process and, and becoming certified? Or how well, are you progressing posts, through it, sorry. Yeah, the goalposts moved, of course, and I think everybody experienced frustration around that. Um, I got an update this morning, vintage about an hour and a half ago, that testing is done on the GeoTab that they have in. Uh, now it's just the administrative shuffle that uh, moves it along. Um, but, and following that will be all the legacy devices. The aim there is to have everything that's currently rolling um, have the ability to be certified by an over the air upgrade. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, John. And Mark, uh, over to you. Same, same question. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike, and I uh, appreciate being amongst these distinguished panelists today. Uh, folks that I've worked with over the years. Uh, Fleet Complete Big Road, we're through, you know, the ELD certification process is well underway. You know, we were in the queue with other ELD vendors, uh, kind of a bit of a luck of the draw where we stand now, but uh, we've worked through the process. We anticipate having an announcement in the very near future. Uh, you know, to echo what everybody else has said, it, it has been challenging. The, the yardsticks have moved. Uh, with the change in the standards back to the drawing board. You know, we've been through the testing with FP Innovations and we're looking forward to uh, be able to, to join the group uh, that is certified in the near future. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mark. And last but not least for this question, um, Mike, we'll flip it over to you. Thank you, Mike. And again, it's a pleasure, just as everybody said, it's a pleasure being here with everybody today. Um, you know, we this uh, process has taken six or seven months for some of these companies that was originally said that was going to take six weeks. And as we've seen, um, it, it is a challenging. Um, we we all have developed an ELD that was self-certified in the United States, and we developed it based on you know our own interpretations of the technical standard. And now what we had to do is to build this and make some changes related to what Transport Canada's interpretation of the technical standards were. On top of that, most of us have very rigorous integrations to other systems um, and, and those in themselves present challenges. So um, at, at Omnitrack, we have a couple of devices that are well into the certification process um, and we anticipate that, you know, within, you know, the next month or so, we should have some of those um, certifications completed. Um, we, we also are different than some of the other companies in that we have multiple platforms. In other words, the code doesn't move from one device to another. Um, and so you're certifying existing code onto um, different hardware. We're completely different ELD codes on completely different hardware. So we have multiple systems that have to go through certification. Some of them are through. Once, uh, once some of them are done, the code is portable to other hardware. So those will go much quicker. And we anticipate that uh, this process is gonna continue for us for a number of months yet, um, still uh, meeting the deadline though for uh, implementation uh, next summer. Okay, thanks, Mike. And I, you know, and I think and everybody uh, on here has kind of brought it up. And I think that's one thing a lot of people wondered, right? Because everybody was hearing before we we were going to be ready by June twelfth, twenty twenty one. And you know, I, on that date, we we didn't have any devices. So I think everybody was kind of maybe caught off guard as to how much, how long it was going to take uh, to get a device uh, certified. Because 
you know, the fact that there was zero tells us it wasn't an issue with, with one or two, it was everybody had challenges trying to come up to the standard. Um, this, this should be a, a shorter answer, but I do want to ask each one of you, and it may be different for, for each device. So Mark, I'm going to start with you this time. If a carrier is transitioning from a non-certified device, what we technically call an electronic recording device, to one that is going to be certified and listed on Transport Canada's list of certified devices, what is this going to look like for the carrier? And what I mean by what it is going to look like, just very simple for, for your platform and your device, is this going to mean that their device is going to have to be removed and replaced, or is it an over-the-air upgrade? And sure. you know, if you, if you have multiple devices, it, the answer may be, well, for some it's this and some it's that. But Mark, I'll, I'll start with you. Sure. And uh, those who have been on any of my sessions know I'm a man of keywords, but uh, I'd like to provide a thorough response. So basically, if the non-certified device is being replaced with a certified device by the same vendor and that, you know, Big Road, Isaac, etc., then it should be fairly straightforward over the air upgrade. Driver will be essentially prompted to enable ELD for the specific ELD device or all devices in the fleet, depending on the circumstances and needs. So as you mentioned, Mike, there are some ELD exemptions. Some fleets and drivers will have scenarios where only a portion of the fleet will need to comply with ELD, while others will not. Based on my experience, some fleets will have a mix, and this adds complexity. So you'd have some ELD, non-ELD uh, vehicles, and it's complex given that sometimes drivers are in an exempt scenario and otherwise not exempt. And this creates complexity, you know, the Murphy's Law in the U.S., uh, day one to day eight within the radius, then you go outside the radius, you throw out the 160, and they're fully fully uh, required to have ELD, then all of a sudden they need the records for the day in question in the previous seven days in the U.S. or 14 in Canada. So what is happening based on my observations is some of the fleets don't want that type of uh, hassle. So they'll just require full ELD compliance for drivers, whether exempt or not. The real big difference is the driver, when exempt, won't have to surrender what's called the ELD output file or what is commonly known as a logbook to the safety official at roadside. The benefit, though, of course, is the driver, if he has otherwise using the ELD, will have all of the historical HOS records, and that could be used you know, at time of a safety audit. So you know, there's added complexity, but there's added protection. So, you know, if, if, if you're going to a scenario where you're going from an existing ELD vendor to a new vendor, then that's going to add a level of complexity. Mark, Mark, I, I don't, I don't mean to cut you off, Mark, but I just, for this one, I think we might get into some of that other stuff later. Okay, sure. For, for this, for this one, we just kind of want to know for your devices that you're submitting, if a carrier has them, is it going to be a remove and a replace or an over the air upgrade? So, yes. So it would be an over the air upgrade provided it's an existing device that we manage. If not, then of course it would have to be removed and then replaced with uh, an, a device that's compliant according to the technical specs and certified okay. on the website. Okay. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Uh, Mike, same question for the, for the Omnitrax devices. Yeah, this is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, other than um, a couple of our devices, uh, which are specifically the MCP units on our enterprise services platform, um, those devices, MCPs, will not be certified in Canada, um, but all other uh, Omnitrack devices will just be an over-the-air upgrade. Okay. Um, thank you. John, over to you. Same question for Geotab. Uh, the, the objective with Geotab, and I think they'll be able to achieve it, is everything rolling over the air upgrade. Okay. Thank you. Uh, John Sebastian, same question for the for the Isaac devices that are, that are going to be certified. Yeah. All the units that are in the field today, Mike, yeah, will be uh, accepting an over the air upgrade to get uh, the EK and ELD. It will be a flip of a switch on the customer side when they're ready to activate all the Canadian ELD features. Uh, they will just activate them when they're ready. But the version with it will be deployed over the air. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, 
Thank you, Fred. And over to you for for Zonar. Yes, similar to everybody else. So our ELD software operates on the Connect, Connect tablet, which is purpose built for Zonar, <clears throat> or the, the Samsung Tab Active too. So it would be an over there update for all of our customers and for those who uh, are looking to get into the market, then it would just be an update on, on that product once they uh, start utilizing it. So all over the air update. Okay. And Frank, last but not least for the, for the Trimble devices. Thanks. Frank. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of echo everyone else here. So we've, we've kind of set up a process by which, uh, you know, for any, for, for all of the uh, certified platforms in Trimble system, um, we've created kind of a rollout plan to ensure uh, like was mentioned, it's an over-the-air update, followed by activation of certain entities for drivers, users, vehicles, just to ensure that that rollout or that rollover process to ELD, as you activate those ELD features, um, is all set up and it kind of allows for the driver training to take place if needed, as well as back office users. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess just clarification for some. So everything that is being, it sounds like from, from all six of you on here today, everything that is being submitted for certification um, is, is going to be able to comply with an over-the-air upgrade. But would I be safe in saying if a, if a model number is more than five years old, it is unlikely that it is going to be able to be uh, upgraded over the air? Uh, Mike, you're shaking your head. That's not fair to say. No, I mean, again, Omnitrax is a pioneer in this uh, area, and, and many people still qual call our units Qualcomm's. And um, yeah. so the IVG unit is well over five years old, and it still will take an over the air update. So, okay. same here, same here, Mike, with the Series One, uh, which is the first generation that we were started selling. Uh, it's going to get the over the air upgrade and will still be compliant with the Canadian ELD. Okay, I'm seeing everybody shaking their heads, so it sounds like Ge that'll Geotab be Geotab as well. Same situation. Okay. Same zoner as well. Big complete big road as well. Yep. Perfect. All right. Good to know. Um, Mike Ahart, I'm going to flip this one over to you, and this is more into the operational end as to how it's going to look for a, a driver or a fleet, and this would apply to any um, device that somebody in is operating. Because um, I think it's important, I think a lot of fleets have this misunderstanding that, well, if my drivers have been using an electronic recording device for 10 years, once they get a certified device in there, they're already used to it, there's no big deal. Um, Mike, how is it going to look for a carrier and for a driver if they go from using what has been until this point in time an electronic recording device, um, one that did not meet the Canadian technical standard to one that will meet the Canadian technical standard? Well, Mike, I, you know, the driver interface with the device may not look a lot different. I mean, most of our units, the driver will still go into drive the same, you know, on duty, off duty, still look very much the same. However, there are differences that drivers are going to have to get used to. Um, I think that some of the biggest ones, the auto transition to drive at eight kilometers per hour, if the driver is using personal conveyance at 75 kilometers, the unit's automatically going to put the driver into drive. And if they're using a yard move at 32 kilometers per hour, it's also going to convert them to a drive status. So automatic transition to drive is not a distance base. You know, many ERDs may have a parameter where, you know, if I set up a, yard, a geofence, uh, that's not going to work anymore. It's a, it is a speed, or I'm sorry, it's either speed or a distance as it relates to PC. Um, also, when motion stops with the vehicle, the unit's going to remain in drive for five minutes unless the driver manually switches themselves to another duty status. This is really important because it can eat up a significant amount of a driver's drive time if they're not actively working through their transition. So again, um, be cautious of that at five minutes. We're gonna prompt them with a warning that you're still in drive. Do you wanna to transition to on duty, not driving? If they ignore it at six minutes, it's on a transition of on duty, but they've lost at that point six minutes. Um, unidentified driving is very, um, very uh, uh, prevalent, and especially when vehicles are being moved and nobody's logged in and they can be, that can be a big issue. 
Um, drivers should always log out of the ELD whenever there's a possibility that somebody else is going to be driving that vehicle because they can get drive time that cannot be moved to somebody else. Um, I'm going to, I know there's several other things, but I'm going to tra transition this over to somebody else, Mike, to let them have their perspective as well. Okay. Um, on this question, guys, Mike covered a lot of topics. I'm just going to throw this one open. Is there anything else uh, that you would like to, to touch on on this topic that Mike, Mike didn't touch on? Yeah, just to just to build on that uh, great response, Mike. Um, the one thing drivers are going to come to realize, especially those that travel north south crossing the border to the United States and vice versa, are going to see the difference in rules, as Mike alluded to. So the important consideration is to make sure uh, that they're in the proper rule in the jurisdiction they're traveling. In many cases, the rules in the United States are are more restrictive than in Canada, with the exception, as Mike mentioned, uh, personal conveyance with the 75 kilometer rule and the yard moves as well. So just being mindful of those and taking advantage of the specific exemptions in either jurisdiction as well. So that's what I would like to add, Mike. It, thanks, uh, thanks, Mark. Anybody else have anything else they wanna to add to, to this question, the difference in going from an ERD to a certified ELD. Yeah, as noted, there are differences. And so it's really important. All of us have said this training the drivers and dispatchers to understand how the ELD operates, uh, what is expected uh, is paramount. And, and if you don't set aside that training, then you're not doing your drivers justice. And, you know, it's difficult to, to keep our drivers uh, in the seats and, and not changing companies or or even bringing in drivers. So make sure that training is done appropriately and, and so they don't have that challenge at roadside. Yeah, full, fully agreed. When when we went to the US one, I think we heard we heard some horrors from some drivers who had basically the switch was turned on, they were thrown in the truck and were told to figure it out. And not surprisingly enough, those were the drivers that uh, weren't real fond of ELDs, but you talked to anybody who who were trained properly in the fleet did the the training through with the supplier the uh um most of them were actually didn't mind the elds at all and actually preferred them so the the training is important you throw somebody to the wolves they're uh, they're not going to be happy so uh, anything else to add from from the rest of you before i move to the next question two key points there uh minutes count <coughs> training is absolutely crucial um, you can lose all kinds of time that could formerly be remedied with an eraser. Um, and you've got to be properly trained so that you're logging out when you should. You're mindful of things like unclaimed drive time, um, personal conveyance, all those things. Okay. All right. Frank, JS, JS, I saw you shaking your head. Frank, anything to add or are we good to move on from this one? Yeah, yeah, I, I would just add, you know, work closely with your provider, understand they should have material that, that shows like what the deltas look like. I think Mike outlined it very well. Those are the key things to know, but, but there should be material available to help, uh, to help your staff and, and drivers understand what those, what those changes will look like. Okay, appreciate it. And, and one thing I would add, um, as somebody who did transition a fleet uh, many years ago into ELDs, the unidentified, unidentified driving time is very, used to see a lot of that, that truck's moving, somebody has to be logged in. So, I mean, drivers are going to have to remember that. And, and I think a key change people are going to see, um, and, and you touched on it a bit, is drivers need to remember to actually log out of the system if they're going to get out of the truck. Um, first of all, in a lot of cases, they need to be logged out, logged back in for updates to take place. Uh, Um, second of all, we used to see it without in their truck to move it or shunt something across the yard. And that driver now has driving time on. And under the systems before that were not certified for Canada, you could actually change that driving time from the back office end and remove it from that driver. You can't do that anymore. Yeah. So if, if, a, if an honest mistake happens and somebody hops in the truck and the driver forgot to log out, that time is assigned to that driver and you can't remove it. So you're going to have to note it by edits and 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 hope that the enforcement officer uh, understands. But yeah, it's going to be very key. I agree that you know office staff that is used to being able to change that driving time is not going to be able to do that anymore. So 
Um, I'm going to move on here, guys. Thanks for those answers. Um, JS, I'm going to start with you on this one, and then if anybody else has anything to add after JS, they can they can jump in. If not, we'll go to the, the next one. But we just talked about how it's going to look for a driver or carrier who goes from an ERD to an ELD. How is this going to differ for somebody who's going from no technology, so somebody who's been using paper and pen and is switching to a fully certified ELD? What's their process going to look like? Thank you, Mike. This is this is a great question. And I mean, this is probably the part we all have the most experience with because we've been through that process with several fleets uh, in 2017, 2019, in that time frame where people were activating ELDs for the first time to go across the border in the US. And a lot of the points that you guys touched on on the unassigned driving, uh, on the on the yard move, on the drivers that forget to lug out. This is what takes the most time to learn for someone that's on paper today. And, you know, there's change management that will happen within your fleet as you're transitioning to paper or some very basic system over to an ELD. And you need the, you know, the biggest enemy is, is time and, and your best ally is time. So prepare and plan for enough time to handle the transition. And, Always remember that changes like this, you don't want them to happen in the busiest season of your operation. You need to look at your calendar year, look at when it's the right time for implementing such a big change, touching everyone in your business. Because moving to an ELD is gonna touch everyone from the driver to operations, to safety, to the garage, everyone is gonna be impacted. So it's important that you figure when in the year is a good time for implementing such a big change involving everyone in your business and work the schedule back. Work the schedule back thinking of, I will need time to adapt and adapt my business to this, right? I will need prior to this time to deploy, to train my drivers, to deploy my units, to probably work on some integrations I want to happen before I deploy a unit, right? So I did it like backwards, but if I was to do it again forward, today you're gonna to be looking at different vendors that are off, that have some offering. Uh, whether they're certified or not, most of the people that you see here will eventually be certified. And you're gonna select the vendor, that's gonna take you guys time. Once, the, the, once the, the, the correct vendor is selected, you'll wanna look at integration. How is that gonna manage with the rest of my operation? That's gonna take time. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you reserve sufficient time for installing the devices, for training the drivers. We've seen this taking easily five, six, seven months for some fleet to do the entire process, even more. So when we're looking at a smooth enforcement in June, smooth enforcement where you, a lot of fleets are in their very busy season in June, probably not the best time to flip the switch on. You need to keep all that in mind. I mean, we're there to help you guys. Uh, the, the, the vendors, we have experience, we've been through it. We've converted hundreds of fleets from using nothing or something basic to an ELD. We have all the documentation, we have all the paperwork, the process, speak to us about it. But again, you need to make sure that you plan for enough time to do this because time is your enemy as much as it's your, it's your highly. Just prepare and plan for enough time. That's my comment about that, Mike. Yeah, no, a lot of, a lot of great points there. Um, you know, I think the advice I would give to everybody, um, you know, if you're researching suppliers and vendors and they tell you the transition process is gonna be easier or they don't offer you any torp of implementation training and basically throw you a manual and say, yeah, it's no big deal, go at her. You probably want to look at a different vendor. A uh, vendor you're looking at should have an implementation strategy and some training that they're going to, to help you with. Um, does anybody else have anything they want to throw on to, uh, to what JS said before we move to the next one? Mike, I see you nodding your head. Yeah. So Mike, I, again, this is the, you know, the, the proverb that everybody knows is, you know, the bigger the ship, the harder it is to turn. And Mike, you and I both also have experience in the private fleet area. And so, you know, again, we have experience knowing that trucks 
don't necessarily belong to drivers, you know, and they get moved around a lot. And again, this issue about unidentified drive time is going to be, I don't know how many people are on this call, but if there's 200, it's going to be your all 200's biggest nemesis. You are going to have problems with unidentified drive time. I can assure you that it's going to happen, and I can assure you that it's going to be a struggle to get your hands around it. And because every time the vehicle gets moved, it has to be accounted for. And it seems mind numbing. Um, it was an issue in the United States. Uh, when I implemented ELD, it was a challenge like no other challenge I'd ever had before. Thousands and thousands of movements a day that went unaccounted for. So again, understand you've got to get your hands around this issue of unidentified drive time and understand why it's occurring and understand how you're going to prevent it going forward. That's what I would add, Mike. Yeah, and I, I would agree. Like I said yep. before I before I took this role on, um, I believe it was 2013 that the fleet I was with at the time, we transitioned into what would be considered ERDs at the time. And I'm thankful to this day we didn't transition the entire fleet at the same time. We took a fleet of, took like 10 of our drivers and transitioned them and then took another 10. And for the first period of time here, right, the biggest issue was people forgetting to log in and people forgetting to log out. Um, because it didn't become second nature for a while yet. Once it becomes second nature, it, it went away uh, for the most part, but it, it did take a while. And uh, yeah, there, it, it was very time consuming and uh, uh, a lot of headaches at the start. But, you know, as they say with anything, no pain, no gain. So in, in the long run, it, it was worth it. But in the, in the short term, yeah, that stress on your training that you got to log in, you got to log in. Um, um I remember Mike going back to 2017 when the US rule was mandated and it was just all hands on deck trying to manage the logistics of uh, you know everybody wanting the devices at the last minute to take advantage of the grandfathering clause. As we know, there's no grandfathering clause in Canada. But the other big thing I came to find, and, and I think it, it could resonate in Canada, is I found a lot of fleets and, and, and you know some drivers, once they had ELD, they were starting to get alerts and getting warnings and getting violations. And what came to the surface for me is really a lack of understanding of the actual regulation. So we have a big focus on the technical spec, making sure we comply, make sure we're, we're certified, but getting back to the training piece, making sure everybody understands what the rules are as well, because you know it's very complex. I've been in this industry 30 plus years. You know It's a fairly short, regulation in in the act in the u.s and in canada but it's very complex he's throwing in sleeper birth rules uh, you got deferred time which is really unique in canada using the definition of a day you know there's a lot of complexity and you'll probably find drivers are going to come to you saying i got a violation i don't understand what this violation is all about i used to do this and get away with this quite frankly for years now and now all of a sudden i've got a violation so it's really important to really understand the regulation as well. So that was another take home that I found with the ELD coming to the, coming to the surface. Yeah, I, I would agree. A lot of people didn't understand the rules and regs as well as we thought they did maybe. And as, as an industry it was our fault for maybe not ensuring they understood the rules and regs as much as, as they should have, not just from a driver end, but from an office end as well. Right. Um, I'm gonna move into the next one just cause we, we do have a significant amount of questions from the audience that have been popping up and I want to get a few more of our our, our prepared ones uh, through as well so um, John I'm going to flip this one to you and just kind of a question and you know JS touched on it a little bit at his uh, reply but how long would you see the process being from ordering of devices. So I'm taking out of the fact that they've already researched three or four suppliers, they've picked a supplier. So they're at the stage that they've now picked a supplier. Once they pick that supplier, how long do you see the process be from ordering the devices until full integration and training has occurred for a mid-sized fleet? And what I'm gonna categorize a mid-sized fleet to is 50 to 100 trucks. So, so John, I'll, I'll start with you on that one. So product specific, response here obviously um but 
assuming your due diligence has been done, you've chosen um, GeoTab in my case, uh, you're looking at up to, we could have, depending on inventory at that time, um, we could have the inventory to get you the devices in a couple of days, uh, but you've got to assume, uh, and we tell almost everybody this these days, um, you've got to assume 30 days, four weeks right there. Um, installation, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a spike in 50 trucks here. Installation is going to be two to four weeks, depending on the availability of the trucks. Uh, if there's rovers out there that you got to chase down, um, that sort of thing, another two to four weeks. Um, once you've got them in, your back end has been done concurrent to that. Uh, the map set up, the database set up, any uh, integrations have been done. Uh, you're then looking at first training the administrative group. That's a few days in most cases. Um, you know where they are, you can convene them, uh, get them, uh, get the training delivered to those folks and move on to the most difficult part being getting the drivers in uh, as promptly as you can and in groups of a size that you can be confident you've delivered the knowledge to them, um, i.e. you don't want 100 drivers in the room when you're trying to deliver something like that. Um, so you get the you get the drivers done. Uh, a good estimate's another four weeks for the drivers involved. Um, once that happens, you, you know you're at about 11 weeks, and you know our our training sort of never stops. We uh, new people on board. We have our own training channel and customer service channel, um, so we kind of never stop the training process with a customer. But, and this is very key to those people out there who are sitting with the, the um, idea that, okay, hard enforcement starts next June, uh, we'll get cracking on it uh, May 1st. And I'm sure all the folks on here have heard that um, sort of statement. That's not the way it's going to happen with anybody, I don't think. You're looking at three months and in a lot of cases, more than that. Uh, and that's after you did your due diligence, selected your solution, and made your order. Okay. Thanks, John. Does anybody have anything um, that they'd want to add on that from their perspective that they, they feel is differing from what John had mentioned? That's pretty so, Mike, I, I, I would add just one thing. We all have to keep in mind we are in a major supply chain uh, hiccup. It, it, and I don't live in Canada, but I'm assuming that it's no different in Canada than the U.S. in the U.S. And on top of that, we've got uh, we've got a microchip shortage issue. Um, and on top of that, in the United States, we have 3G that's being eliminated. And so a lot of units are going out um, into the field currently, which is eating up a lot of supply um, that exists today. So that's something else I think people need to keep in mind. Yeah, and, and we do have that that question later on too, in the microchip shortage and, and the component shortage. But yes, yeah, very good point. Uh, anybody else have anything else? Thanks for that, uh, John and Mike. And, and this one may be hard to answer, but uh, and I know this is one of the questions that has popped up in our chat window as well. But um, you know, right now the the deadline that most jurisdictions have announced for full enforcement is June 12th of 2022. Do we feel this is achievable? Um, and Fred, I'm going to start with, with you on this one. So the, the enforcement date of June 12th of 2022, is this achievable in your opinion? And if so, yes, if not, why not? Well, I mean, thanks for the question, Mike. Um, I would say that that's a question that CCMTA should answer and it should be a, uh, uh, addressed during their upcoming conference in November and, and they should provide some detailed information not only to uh, to all the jurisdictions there but also to, uh, to the industry on what they anticipate and what to expect from all jurisdictions. And as you already indicated, there's two jurisdictions already talking about giving um, written warnings. So 
obviously jurisdictions are going at it a different way. Um, but I think some and most will have the rule adopted. Um, but it's for them to tell us and, and as, as, as suppliers and, and supporters of the industry, um, all of us have been connected to the jurisdictions and, and to Transport Canada in this process. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Um, I mean, certainly uh, the effective date of June last year came and went. And so I would anticipate that for a lot of jurisdictions, it won't be a hard date either, but we'll have to see what they say. Is, thanks, thanks, Fred. Is, does anybody else uh, have anything they want to add to, to Fred's reply? I think, Mike, one, one thing I'd add, it's hard for us to answer for the provinces and the jurisdiction. I mean, they all have their own roadmap. They all have their own milestone they need to hit. I think one thing is for sure is we're ready on our side, and that's that's what we can bring to the industry. We got we got devices that are there that are certified that are ready to be used. I mean, that's our service to the industry. That's what we're promoting, and and that part is ready as far as we're concerned. So for the jurisdiction, it's really for them to line their ducks in a row and and get their things going. But it's hard for us to to give you any feedback on if it's feasible or not. Only them know. I'm thinking because of the fact there's now three certifying bodies, that should take some of the pressure off the uh, supply chain to actually get the vendors fully certified. In the case of, you know, some of the vendors on this call, even but we're all waiting to get this process done. I don't foresee that it will lag in through to June 12, 2022. The big, the big uh, differentiators, as everybody said, is the enforcement bodies getting up to speed understanding the rules. I, I speak to a lot of uh, jurisdictions and making sure the frontline officers who are going to see a whole bunch of different types of devices will understand how the devices are used, how to receive the transmission of the ELD, you know, looking at the ELD information pack. And that's something else I've come to see in the United States, making sure drivers are armed with the ELD information packet and also having the backup paper log, which is always going to be the fail safe. But for the date itself, again, we have to defer to, to our governments, both provincially and federally. Uh, anyone else want to add anything? Building off what Mark said, um, yes, we have very much so. We have to uh, depend on the, the various provincial governments, but also the fleets themselves. Um, they've really got to pay attention, and I would say now, uh, to um, their due diligence if they plan to do it and their uh, implementation. And uh, there's so many out there that I don't believe, at least in my impression, are not paying a lot of attention to it and don't intend to until we get into the spring. Uh, well, and I think, you know, I'll, I'll add some commentary here. It's I think a couple of things we have to look at is, one, and it was mentioned by, by a couple of you, we have to make sure all the provinces and territories and the feds are all on board here, because if we have one province that decides, you know, I'll just throw a name out there. Uh, let's say Manitoba decides to start full enforcement on June 12th of 2022. Well, if you're a carrier who goes from East coast to West coast, June 12th of 2022 is now your de facto enforcement date. Cause if one province is enforcing it full force, uh, that means you have to be compliant with the regulation by that date. So we need to make sure they all, kind of start enforcement on this at the same time it's, it's critical something we struggle with in this country but it's critical that we need to be on the same page when it comes to the jurisdictions um second of all i think we you know we talked about the timelines we're eight months away from june 12th we have six devices that are certified um we need to have enough devices that are certified in time for carriers to be able to either purchase them and get them in the trucks or upgrade the ones that they have and give them in their trucks. Um, I'm fully in favor of ELDs, always have been, um, as our, our association is. Um, I think we have to we have to seriously look at it and talk to the jurisdictions, and you know it's got to be brought up at the November meeting. We we want this date in place for enforcement as soon as possible, but we have to make sure that the industry can comply reasonably. The ones that are sitting back doing nothing 
that that's your own problem. But well, we have to make sure that if they're due diligent carriers and doing their best, that they have time to get it in. And we have to make sure that uh, there can be enough devices supplied that everybody who has to comply with this regulation can be compliant in time. So it's, you know, the, the wheels are spinning and the date's getting close, I think is, is what we'd say. But, you know, it is looking more positive. We've seen, we've seen quite a few devices added recently and I, I suspect quite a few more on the way. One last question from from us, and then we'll go into the the ones from the um, uh, the audience, which we do have quite a few of. How serious? And Mike, you touched on it a bit, but how serious is the microchip shortage? Will this or any other component shortage have an effect uh, on the manufacturers being able to manufacture enough devices and get them delivered in people's hands? Uh, to meet the demand. And, and Frank, I'm going to have you you start with this one. And then if, if anybody has anything else to add, they, they can jump in. But Frank, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. So ensuring that our solution is certified in Canada was important for us. And we were fortunate enough to achieve that milestone. But the availability of um, the equipment is also top of mind. Uh, so um, like most technology providers, we've experienced some supply chain challenges related to the, the chip shortage. Um, but through our OEM relationships, we've also seen a broader impact of the issue uh, with OEMs having you know half built trucks parked waiting for components, which is disruptive for trucking overall. Um, but from a Trimble perspective, uh, this issue has resulted in a shortage of some of our products. Um, but we've been fortunate to have a high level stock of uh, alternative solutions. Uh, and then we've also been uniquely positioned to leverage Trimble's global supply chain and procurement groups to work around these challenges and acquire some of those most needed parts. Um, so yes, these supply chain problems are real and impacting the industry, uh, but we're confident in our ability to, to, to fulfill our customers' needs. Uh, anybody else have anything to to add to what Frank said? Frank, thanks for that, Frank. Same, same here. Uh, like for us, Mike. Uh, of course, like the chip shortage is not going to keep like any any electronic device manufacturer or is impacted by this. The good news is we have a ton of stock, a ton of units in stock, screens, cradles, recorders, antennas. We can supply a lot of units. We prepared ahead for this, you know, ELD certification that was coming. And today it's not like, you know, we're not, we're not concerned about like the number of units we can deliver over the next 12 months. It's not going to be an issue. If people need devices, we have devices to supply them so they can be compliant. So I would, oh, go ahead, Fred. No, I was just adding a bigger picture, uh, not only ELD, but how the uh, the chip shortage is going to impact um, uh, everything, uh, especially the 3G shutdown. Uh, you got alarm systems, you have cameras, you have everything from an OEM truck to a car to um, uh, you name it. It's going to impact uh, across the board. So I would just, you know, those that are registered and listening, you just know how that may impact your operation, not only ELD, but across the board on everything that you utilize, because that 3G shutdown could happen and it could, well, it will happen, but it could really impact certain points of your operation if you're using 3G on something else. And, and I would add, again, if, if you have devices in your vehicles that are just going to get over the air upgrade, this isn't, this is a, a mute point. The, the challenge is for the fleets that have nothing or fleets that are thinking about changing because maybe a device that they're using today won't be certified. Those are the people that this impacts. And again, a number of devices out there now even use a consumer grade tablet. I don't know that you can just go down to your Best Buy now and just pick up, tab you know, if you need 100 tablets, whether or not they're going to be available to you and at what cost. So, you know, these are things that there's a segment of the fleets that need to be thinking about this, not necessarily everybody. Okay. Thanks, Mike. And anything else before we move into the, uh, the audience questions? All right, hey, Mike. Hey. Just just one thing I want to bring up, and we, nobody has touched on this is 
you know, especially fleets that are transitioning from paper to um, to the ELD, but also ERDs to ELDs. This roadside inspection PDF that drivers will be looking at and enforcement will be looking at is very different than anything anybody has seen in their life. Even the ELD providers, when we first saw this, we were like, what is this? Um, and so I think it's important to um, make sure that if, if somebody has not done it yet, go to the technical standards. Mike, you put up the CCMTA website, go to the technical standards, um, pull down those technical standards and look at the example of what the, what the PDF is gonna look like. Understand that it is different and also understand that this idea of 15 minutes uh, increments no longer makes a difference. It's all minute by minute, in some cases, even down to the second. So Mike, I just wanted to bring that up. No, no good point for sure. Um, so I'm gonna move into some audience questions. Thank you guys for everything you've answered so far. While we're taking the audience questions, I'm gonna launch a, a poll that I put up. There is three questions in the poll and it's just kind of for, uh, um, you know, for curiosity's sake, I guess. Um, so I'm gonna launch the poll and then we're gonna get into the questions and I'll, I'll, pose, I'll post the results of the poll just before we, we get off the call. So uh, you should see it come up. The poll is going to come up um, now. So the poll should be there and I'm going to move into answering some of these, these chat questions, uh, guys. So let me... Mike, are we supposed here. to see? Are we supposed to see the questions already, or when I launch the poll, this no, you won't be able to see them unless they put it to you. I got okay. them here, and I'll and I'll read them out. Perfect. Some of them could have put them to everybody. Some just put them to uh, to myself. Um. So here's the first question, and I think we've kind of touched on this, but devices are back ordered for several months. Uh, any discussions about extending the date again, giving the issue securing devices in the industry? Uh, so uh, about extending the date, I think we touched on that. Um, I wouldn't say there's heartfelt discussions now. The, the industry is certainly, the jurisdictions are certainly aware of where we stand uh, as an industry and where it is. I think everybody's looking at that June 12th date. Um, will it have to be extended? I don't think there's any prep. There, I don't think anybody's prepared to make that decision yet. Uh, they'll keep an eye on the goalposts, I think, and we'll keep an eye on the goalposts with them and with our with the suppliers and see where we go. Um, anything else to add on devices being back ordered for for several months from you guys, other than what we just covered in the chip shortage? No. Nope. Okay. Um, this one I can answer quickly. Does the supplier have the ability to go with any certification company they choose, or is it just randomly assigned? Uh, the answer to that is no, you choose which, which certification company you want to go to. So there's three out there. Um, many manufacturers maybe who are submitting multiple devices may use more than one certification body if they have four or five, six, seven devices certified, but you have the ability to choose who you go to. Uh, it, there is a fee that suppliers have to pay. For the, for the process. And it doesn't guarantee you're gonna get certified. And Mike, one thing we haven't touched on is device recertification. There's a process for recertifying the device, uh, you know, on a, on a regular basis. So, I mean, to your point, we can be selecting a different uh, certifying body at each step. It doesn't matter what we're doing, so. Okay. Uh, any, anybody, anything else to add to that, guys? Okay, um, what device needs to be certified? The hardware hooked to the truck or the handheld mobile device that connects by Bluetooth to the hardware that is connected to the truck? Who wants to handle that one? Mike Ayer has got his hand up, go ahead. Yeah, so, so all components that essentially constitute the ELD is what has to be certified. So if, if you use a specific type of device that plugs into your, your uh, bus and that device works with a tablet, um, the tablet itself doesn't have to be certified. The only difference is if it's an Android tablet versus an iOS. So you know between the two of them, they would have to each be certified because it's really the operating system, the, the, the uh, ELD software 
So it's all of these components together, which constitutes the ELD that has to be certified. So if you operate, for example, John, with uh, Geotab, you can talk about different devices, you know, that plug into a V bus, you know, or into the, to the bus that constitute multiple, e could constitute multiple ELDs. And, and, and to complement, like, it's really like the, the software that's running on the device and the dongle. You see, in our case, we have one software, but we have two versions of the dongles, like the series one and the series two. So that means we have two devices that are certified. If we had a second software, to Mike's point, that's running on another platform, then that would duplicate the number of devices that we need certified. Yeah, and, and I think that's a key point too, not for you. Not for you guys, I think we all understand it on this call, but carriers need to understand if, if the model number that's in your truck is now listed as certified, don't assume that that means you're good to go and you don't have to do anything. You got to look at what the software version is in yeah. that model number and make sure it's the software version that has been approved. And if you have a good supplier, your supplier is going to make sure you know that. But when the air, air over the air upgrade is sent to you, you're going to have to accept it. Otherwise, you as a carrier do not have a certified device, even though you have the right model number. You have to make mm -hmm. sure the software version is the software version that has yeah. been approved. So yeah. um, anything else on that, guys, before I move on to the next question we have? To your point, it is occasionally challenging for some fleets to upgrade in a timely manner, and that's where you'll run into these issues at roadside. If you have an officer who's going to be very diligent and going to cross-reference the version of the software they see on the website with what is being shown at roadside, if that doesn't match, then that leads to potential enforcement issues at roadside. Yeah, and we have to make sure officers know to check for that because if yeah. they don't, we're going to let a large segment of the industry be non-compliant, which is not what we want. So we have to yeah. make sure officers know what to check for. Um, this exactly. is kind of an opinion question, I, I, I guess, from the person. Uh, I mean, I'll, <laughs> I'll have one of his answer because we have five minutes left and I do want to get to a few more if we can. Uh, why are they making it so difficult to get certified and why can't Canada simplify uh, the certification process? Uh, it should not be this complicated. Um, but who wants to, to touch that one? Fred, I see you with a wide grin in your face. Do you want to take this one or, or does anybody want to touch this one? <laughs> 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 well, I mean, it is what it is. It's it's a process. It's, uh, you know, the technical standards. Um, you know, there's a lot of test cases that have to be done. Uh, could it have been simplified? Uh, probably so. But, you know, you still want to hold, hold each ELD um, software and vendor to the same set of standards. It has to be completely the same. So if you have, you know, the different uh, uh, bodies that are doing the certification, they have to test exactly the same. So there, there's there's some rigor to it. Um, you know, the, the challenge is that it, we, we started late and that's why everything's late and that's why it seems like it's taken so long. And, and remember, this is new for everybody. It's new for the, the certified bodies. It's, it's new for uh, Transport Canada. It's going to be new for uh, those that, that are out in the field. The vendors are the only ones that have been been working with the ELD product uh, uh, for a number of years. So uh, I think that's the challenge. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and yet, I, yeah, sorry, ahead. Mike, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so the, we had the rule for, for the first part. We built our software understanding the rule, so it matches the rule. But then they came out with the test plan. And to build a test plan that's going to be, that is identical for each and every device is out there, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing easy there that they were trying to accomplish. And when we go through the test phase, that's where you're like, oh, but that's not how our device works. That's how it works. Well, the test plan says this is how it should work. So either you go back to Transport Canada and ask them for a rectification, or you follow the test plan and you give us a device that's going to meet it. So that's where the challenge and the delays are created. I mean, essentially, what we had ready in February of last year, when we first pushed it over to the certifying body, was almost identical to what we have today. The things that were changed were just small little bits of details that needed to be changed so we fit the actual test plan. That's where the delays were incurred. Today, the test plan is there. We went with it. 
I mean, for the future versions and everything, certification is going to be straightforward. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a good point. And then Mark, you touched, I mean, we were late getting started, right? And, yeah. and, and then the first devices that were submitted, well, if you say are, we're almost guinea pigs, and then the process had to be figured out, but the process was being figured out when we were already under a time crunch. So it, it, it created where we were. So the other big challenge, of course, is you have two jurisdictions with different rules. So the test standards are different in other jurisdictions. So again, vendors on the call, we've set up based on the self-certification model in the US with the test uh, requirements in the US. Now we have Canada with the fully certified. And then the other big uh, factor is as we move forward, provincial jurisdictions are going to have to adopt specific regulations for intra-provincial travel as well. So that'll be interesting to see how that plays out as well. Yeah, and I, I'm gonna jump in here quick, guys. And it, does everybody have a few more minutes or does everybody have to jump right at, right at noon in two minutes? Good to sit on as long as you like, Mike. Okay, I got time. If you, okay, if you guys are okay, I wouldn't mind just getting to a few more. I think we can wrap her up within five or 10 minutes, but. Um, and you know what you touched on in the US, I think it's key to point out, we didn't want that. There's over 700 devices approved in the US and most of them would not be approved if people tried to check on them. So yeah. this, is, this, this rigorous process is what was needed because we gotta make sure people are using devices that are certified because there's a lot of devices that were approved in the self-certification model that made it easier for people to cheat, not make it harder for people to cheat. And that was the exact opposite of what we were trying to do here. So mm -hmm. the certification process was important. Um, one person asked if a specific vendor is in the mix. Uh, I can't answer that. They want to know who is going to be, who submitted for certification. Uh, we don't know um, publicly what device is in for the certification process or so when it's coming in or out. Uh, you'd have to ask your vendor that and, and check up on them appropriately. but. Uh, I can't answer that question because I don't know the answer to that question if if a specific vendor is in the process of being certified or not. Um, even even the certifying bodies will not divulge that information. So correct. Yeah. Uh, do any of you anticipate any issues with U.S. enforcement's acceptance of Canadian ELDs, or will it be relatively seamless when compared to existing ELDs? Uh, I'll touch on that quickly, and you guys can expand if you want. Uh, no, it'll be the other way around. That they they know if it's certified to the Canadian standard, it is certified. If it meets our standard, it's definitely going to meet theirs. Uh, you're going to see issues with devices that are certified in the U.S. that are never going to be certified up here. Um, yeah. Anybody have anything to to add to that process? You're straight there. That's you, you, the you hit it right hit it right on the mark, Mike. Uh, I think the U.S. carriers moving north with the LDs, they're they're ones that are going to find a little shocking based on the different, you know, the certifying yeah. requirements. That's exactly yeah, right. Like and I, I think there's an overall lack, there seems to be an overall lack of awareness with a lot of uh, U.S. Yeah. carriers. For sure. Yeah, there, there's a lot of people that think it's it's been certified here, they'll accept it, they always have, but that, that's not the case. It's, it has to be certified to, mm -hmm. to the standard up here. Um, Somebody asked me where they can look a list of what it comes to be, um, where they can see a list of the technical specifications that have to be met. You will be given a copy of this PowerPoint in there as a link to the full technical standards. So anybody on here can look in it and see what the specs are that each manufacturer has to meet. Um, another person is asking, will there be a livestock exemption? Uh, no. I, there's not going to be one again. Uh, nobody's lobbying for it. Nobody's pushing for it. I don't believe we're going to see one. Like that. Why? We're not going to see one. Um, specific question about unidentified driving time. Under the Canadian reg, can the driver still reject um, the unidentified driving time if it does not belong to him or her? Can this rejected unidentified drive time be assigned to the shop if they had moved the truck? Um, I'm going to ask one of is to handle that because, I, um, again, we're getting over time. So who wants to touch on the, the unidentified driving time? I can touch on it. Uh, you know, the biggest thing I get questions about, particularly with fleets that have, I call them exempt drivers, mechanics, uh, people that give driver training, et cetera, et cetera, not your traditional driver. They should consider having an exempt driver account to mitigate the instances of unidentified driving so that it will be assigned properly and you'll prevent that from 
being an issue, uh, you know, proactively. Yeah. And I think the key thing to do would be if you're going to have shop driving the truck, you should have a code identified for your shop that your shop can punch in so you don't have to yeah. sign that time. Yeah, because the biggest problem is like in the, in the, it's the assigned driving to the driver because he forgot to log out. That's, that's going to be one of the biggest issues because it, it breaks his recap hours, is break, it breaks like for the next coming 14 days. We're not going to tell him how many hours he's got left just because during the rest period, a mechanic moved the truck with him logged in. So, you know, the unassigned driving, it's like giving the shop a user password is going to solve, it's also going to solve that problem. They will need to log the driver out before they log themselves in and start moving the truck. So, I mean, it's going to cover a lot of ground there. Uh, yeah. yeah, Mike, it goes back to what we talked about before on training and making sure that everybody understands how to utilize, how, how they can uh, assign the unidentified driving and make sure that you work with the vendors to uh, to do that. And and we've all experienced it. We know how, how to, to uh, work through it. Uh, so make sure you work with that vendor. Okay. Um, one last question, guys. Will for carriers using a software program on multiple devices, so an Apple or Android, um, be responsible for ensuring the software is approved and updated to be in compliance? Um, well, of course, the carrier is going to have to ensure that the the program that they're using is in compliance. Uh, Fred, you were shaking your head on that. Was there something you wanted to, to ask there? Well, I mean, it's it's always up to the carrier to make sure they meet their requirements, but but it's also the vendor's responsibility as well. So the carrier needs to work with the vendor to make sure that that, that device that they're utilizing has been certified and the software is certified within the use. Um, so if it's not if it's not part of the certified list, you can't utilize it for ELD. Yeah, for sure. All right, guys, that is the, the end of the questions. I posted the poll. There was only 23 people in there. Uh, 20 of the 23 said they are using an ERD, so that's that's promising. Um, is it listed on the on the the list? 52% um, no, 17% unsure. Again, we had 160 people on 23 answered, so not much you can take from it. But I, I think you know we're seeing a bit of a hit and hit and miss there. But I think after today, uh, every will hopefully be a lot more educated. So. Uh, Guys, uh, I think Mike, we already lost him. I think he had to jump off by the looks of it. But uh, I want to thank you guys for your for your time, for sticking it out for a few extra minutes to answer these questions. And uh, again, thanks for your expert and, and knowledge and, and, and for the role you're playing in ensuring we're going to have certified ELDs uh, out there that are going to, uh, you know, do the, the role that they're supposed to do, which is ensure better compliance with hours of service, not the, the other way around. So thanks for your time, guys. Thanks for your, thanks for your work. And uh, we'll catch up again soon. Thanks Thank for you. the invitation, Mike. Yeah. Thanks, for the privilege. thanks for the privilege of being on the panel, Mike. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, guys. And, and to the audience, thanks for taking time out of your day to attend today. Thanks again to our sponsors, Sweet Metrica and Kim Richardson Transportation Specialists. Uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Um, stay safe, stay healthy. Take care.